essence of the good news is that God refused to remain distant, that God actually chose to enter into the very world that he created. No matter what you're experiencing in life, no matter what you're faced with in life, you can actually have joy. Well, good morning, Lake City. It is so good to see you all here for our second gathering of the day. And uh, preemptively, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you. And I'm just really excited. We get to continue on in our uh, Christmas series called Unboxing, Ser- uh, Unboxing Christmas. And we've anchored this particular study series in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, which says this. It, it says, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. And so far throughout the series, we've talked about uh, how we can have incredible hope because Jesus is our Wonderful Counselor. I especially loved uh, singing O Holy Night, and that one line just resonated so deeply with me, a thrill of hope, a weary world rejoices. Man, is that so applicable to us right now, 2020? And Jesus is that thrill of hope. Jesus is the hope for our lives. We've talked about the joy that we can have because he is our mighty God. And today, what we're going to be looking at is the idea behind why Isaiah would describe Jesus, our Messiah, as our everlasting Father. Now, Father, in this particular context, in the original Hebrew that, was, that it was written in, if you want to seem like really super scholarly and be like a Hebraic master, uh, the word for Father is Ab, and it's super easy to spell, A-B. You got it. I just taught you something new right there. Ab, and it means father. And the best way to really understand this word in this context is as a figure of speech that was commonly used throughout the ancient world of that time to describe a benevolent ruler that shared such care and concern for his people, it was as if they were his own children. Many leaders, many rulers were known in the ancient world as the father of the nation. And so when we read about Jesus being our everlasting father, what it's being used for is to describe the unbelievable love that Jesus has for us. That he is not distant, that he is not far off, that he is not detached, he is not removed, he is near, he is God with us. He is close and personal and relational. He is our everlasting Father. He loves us. Now, I recognize that when we talk about the word love, it can get a little bit tricky as we try to hone in on what that word means. Here's why. I can say that I love tacos, and I do a lot. Like the dad bod is creeping up on me, and it's like 90% due to tacos. Okay, I love tacos. But here's what I can also say. I can say I love Lindsay, my wife. And that's true. Just in case anyone was wondering, that's true. In fact, in fact, on Tuesday, it was the 13-year anniversary of the night that I proposed to Lindsay on a cold, snowy night in downtown Spokane. I popped the question, waiting for her answer, and she said, did you ask my dad? I was like, yes, I asked your dad, what's your answer? (laughs) And I locked her in, baby. So I love Lindsay. Now, if we step into like the social media realm, uh, you can, I I, I can like, I don't just have to like your post on Facebook. I don't have to just give you a thumbs up. I can give you a heart. I can love your post. Like if the picture of the dinner that you made was like particularly inspiring, love it. Love it. So I can love tacos, I can love my wife, and I can love your Facebook post. So we, but are, are, are all those things equal? No. Clearly, my love for my wife is different than my love for my tacos and my love for your Facebook post. 
So we have different values that we bring to the table when it comes to the word love. How about this? On top of all of that, we bring different, defi- we bring different definitions of love as we filter the idea of love through our own personal experiences, whether they're good or bad, whether through our own personal expectations, whether they're good or bad or healthy or unhealthy. We can even filter our definition of love through our own personal education as we learn more about ourselves and how we give and receive love, right? Right now, like the popular thing is the Enneagram test, right? What type are you? And so we see, you know, on Instagram, someone posts something like, I'm an Enneagram type three. And so I receive love through words of affirmation and gifts that boost personal productivity, just know, like, if you post something like that, that's how I'm re- That's the voice that I'm reading your Enneagram post in. I'm an Enneagram type three. <laughs> oh, I won't even go any further on that. That's too embarrassing. Right? But we, we filter how we conceptualize the idea of love through our experiences, expectation, education. So now we've got not only different values, but now we've got different definitions And on top of all of this, Isaiah uses the metaphor, the figure of speech of father to describe the love that Jesus has for us. And here's what I know to be true, is that there are probably many in this room and many watching online that the word father carries a negative connotation with it, carries some baggage with that title. In fact, one time I was leading worship at a, at a leader gathering that we were hosting. We were singing the song, Good, Good Father. It was, it was super popular, you know, a couple of years ago. And it's all about God's love for us and how he is our good father and he's perfect in all of his ways and that our identity can be really rooted and based on his love for us. And so I'm, I'm leading our group in this song, and I notice that one of our leaders, who's normally like very bubbly, very outgoing, very joyful, like energetic, and, and all of a sudden, she became visibly upset. So much so that after our, our time of worship together, I approached her and said, hey, uh, is everything okay? Like, it's just, it seemed like... It seemed like something was going on. Is there anything that, that we can do or help out? What's going on? And, and she goes on to tell me the story about how her father was an alcoholic, was abusive, and walked out on her and her family when she was 10 years old. And here's what I know to be true, is that that's not at all uncommon And her words to me were this. She said, if God is a father, then I want nothing to do with him. So when we start pulling apart a verse like Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, what I'm getting at is that we have to recognize that we bring some things to the table as we try to wrap our minds around it. We, we bring some things to the table as we try to, to really reconcile the idea of the love of Jesus, as we bring our own values and we bring our own definitions and maybe even some of our own baggage to that table. And those things can actually be a little bit of a hindrance from us really fully receiving and believing the love that Jesus has for us. So what, what, what do we need to do? Well, the call really is for us to unbox Jesus from the confines of our idea of what love is. Even if that idea is based off of our own personal experiences and our own life and our own expectations, we need to unbox Jesus from that. And we need to rest in how Jesus defines love. And how Jesus has demonstrated love. And so how has Jesus defined love? Well, I'm going to give you three key words here. First, the love of Jesus is unconditional. The love of Jesus is unconditional. A few years back, I ran in a Thanksgiving uh, 5K race. There's like 300 or so people there. I placed 22nd. So I'm not sure if you knew this, but I'm kind of a big deal. Just... (laughs) FYI, the leftover turkey trot 2016 in Yakima, Washington. 
22nd place, okay? In fact, I got a, I got a medal. Check this out. This is my highest athletic achievement right there. Boom. And uh, I, now let me tell you something about the medal that's around my neck in that picture. I didn't get it after the race. I actually got it before the race even started. It was the most bizarre thing. I get to the race, I check in, they give me my number, and then the lady's like, oh, and here's your medal. I was like, wait a second. Aren't you supposed to like run the race and then get the award? She's like, oh no, we're just giving them to the first 275 people that show up. (laughs) And so ladies and gentlemen, we found something worse than a participation trophy. It's a registration medal, okay? Like... It was so bizarre. Like, it just did not compute in my head that I didn't have to do anything to earn the reward. And to be honest with you, I think that's the same hurdle that we need to get over when we come to try to understand God's love for us. The love of Jesus that that is available to us, it's unconditional. There's nothing that we could ever do to earn it. There's nothing that we could ever do to deserve it. It, There's nothing at all that we could do that would cause Jesus to love us any less or any more. His love is completely unconditional. And, and, you know, to be honest with you, I'm not just saying that, you know, it's Christmas time. I want you to feel warm and fuzzy and happy holidays. And mm. I'm saying that because that's what the Bible says. Look at what Romans 5, 6 through 8, it says, You see, at just the right time, while we were still powerless, whatever you're following along with, whether it be your notes or your phone or your Bible, whatever, circle that word powerless. When we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Go ahead and circle ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. Verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love. Again, it's this idea of let's unbox Jesus from our idea of love. Let's rest in how he defines love. How does God demonstrate his own love for us? Well, it says this, while we were still sinners. Go ahead and circle that word, sinners. Christ died for us. What were those words that we just circled? We were powerless. We were ungodly. We were sinners. We have a past. We've made mistakes. We fall way short of God's standard of holy perfection. And yet, Jesus loves us. His love is not based on merit. In fact, our best days could never earn his love And our worst days could never disqualify us from his love. Think about your best days. When you are just, when you are holy, holy, holy. You wake up in the morning, you got your Bible out, and you're memorizing scripture. You're spending time in prayer. You listen to Christian radio all day. You don't cuss out the person that tries to beat the light on 95, which I'm learning now as a new resident of Coeur d'Alene that that's a thing. Like when that light turns red or green on 95, you wait three seconds and then you go. <laughs> it's like your holiest day, the best day of living, being as Christian as you possibly can. Our best days could never earn his love or cause him to love us anymore. And our worst days, and I don't know what comes to mind. When you think of your worst day, I don't know what comes to mind, but you know. On our worst days, we're never disqualified from his love. A day where we're really impatient with our kids, where we're unkind to our spouse, where we fall back into temptation, where we do that thing that we said we would never do again, when we make that mistake, when we do something that we regret later on, our worst days could never disqualify us from his love. And, you know, I I think this is so beautiful because it really has a big implication for us. And that is that if his love is unconditional, 
that now we have something to anchor our identity to that is completely separate from our own achievements, completely separate from anything that we can do. It rests in what Jesus has already done for us. You know, I think as a society right now, I think we're really struggling with the idea of identity. And individuals are going to such extreme lengths to try and carve out an identity for themselves that would bring fulfillment to their life. I think we culturally are having a difficult time answering the question, who am I? And I'm just so grateful that the unconditional love of Jesus answers that question for us, that no matter who we are, no matter where we come from, no matter what we've done, no matter what our past looks like, no matter what we think our future might look like, we are unconditionally loved. That before anything else could be used to define us, we are loved by Jesus unconditionally. Jesus' love is unconditional. Secondly, the love of Jesus is sacrificial. I love what Matthew 20, 28 says. It says, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, Christmas time is the opportunity for us to celebrate the birth of Jesus, the arrival of our Messiah, God clothing himself with flesh and becoming one of us. We celebrate this unbelievable gift. But it's also an opportunity for us to look ahead to what the birth of Jesus signaled. And that was, it was the starting point of the greatest rescue mission the world has ever known. And that is to rescue us from our sin. The Bible is so clear from cover to cover that all of us, myself, you, those of you who are tuning in online, all of us are imperfect. We miss the mark of perfection. You know, I love, one of the things I love about Lake City is that that's just like, that is well known. Like no perfect people allowed. We are a gathering of imperfect people. That imperfection is called sin. And the Bible's clear that sin has some consequences. In fact, the Bible describes the consequences of sin as a wage, meaning that what we rightfully earn from our sin, the paycheck that we pick up for our sin, is death. And that's not a physical death that we all will experience where we'll be lowered into the ground, but it's a spiritual death of being separated from God for eternity. But here's the beautiful thing about what Jesus has done for us is that Jesus, motivated by love, came and took our place. He came and took our place. He stepped in and took responsibility for our sin. He took in and he stepped in and took ownership for our sin. Let's, let's really tease this apart and see what that means. That means that he took our sin upon himself as if they were his own. So think, think about this. Any sin that you've ever committed, past, present, or future, Jesus, in the eyes of God, has stepped forward and said, that was actually me. You know that time that Mitch did that? No, that was actually me. That time that Mitch said that, that was actually me. That time that Mitch thought that, that was actually me. This is what Jesus has done for us. He stepped in and he took ownership of our sin, but he didn't just take ownership of our sin, he took the punishment for our sin and paid that on the cross. In short, Jesus has done for us what we could never do for ourselves. That's the message of the gospel. And that is what Christmas really points us to, that Jesus has done for us what we could never do for ourselves. I like what 1 John 3.16 says. It says, this is how we know what love is. This is how we know what love is. Let's take Jesus out of our box. Let's see how he defines it. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. How has Jesus defined love? It's through his sacrifice. It's through his sacrifice. And I think this is beautiful because 
Not only does the sacrifice of Jesus mean that we can be free and forgiven from our sins, but it also means that we never have to question our value again. Have you ever watched the Antique Roadshow? It's a crazy show, isn't it? Like, you wouldn't think it's crazy, and then you get hooked into it, and you, like, binge watch a few episodes of it. It's insane. Here's why. People bring junk. (laughs) They bring junk. And then they get it appraised, and it's worth, like, thousands of dollars. And all of a sudden, it's not so junky anymore. This lady, her name's Claire Beckman. She had bought a card table, like a wooden card table, at a garage sale. She noticed it was dirty, it was super old, it even had a little mold on the underside. She's like, you know what? 30 bucks is a little steep for this card table. How about 25? Deal. She buys this card table for for $25. 30 years goes by, and the antique roadshow is coming through her town. She goes, ah, let's just see. Let's just see. So she brings it in. And to her astonishment, It turns out that this table was made by a furniture company called Seymour & Sons, which was a fine furniture company in the 1700s. And this table that she bought 30 years earlier for $25 was appraised at $250,000. Here's a picture of the moment she found out. She's like, what? (laughs) I mean, can you imagine that? She's like, man... I mean, that's a good profit margin. I was telling Pastor Mike earlier this week, it's like, that's the hustle I need to get into. Like, I need to get more into garage sailing. I need that. But now, here's the thing. It gets even crazier because it was a praise at $250,000, but it sold at auction for $541,000. Half a million dollars for a $25 purchase. Man. So I'm going to see all you guys out there at the garage sailing market this spring. Get out of my way. That's my card table. (laughs) What does this teach us, though? It teaches us this, that the true value of something is determined by what someone is willing to pay for it. And Jesus laid down his life for you. Jesus laid down his life for me. 1 Corinthians 6.20 says that you were bought at a price. The sacrificial love of Jesus means that we have eternal and inexpressible value, that we are free from our sin, that we are truly loved. So the love of Jesus is unconditional. It is sacrificial. And lastly, the love of Jesus is enduring, enduring. I'm a, I'm a documentary nerd. In a major way. In fact, the highlight of my weekend was, well, actually, no, the highlight of my weekend was on Friday, we signed the closing documents for our house here in Coeur d'Alene. Yes. Yes. What a journey, right? We started in September and landed one, hooked it, landed it here at the end of December. We made it. Feels good to get some roots down. But the other highlight of my week (laughs) was sitting on the couch. I had my five-month-old son, Levi, in one arm. I had my six-year-old daughter, Natalie, in my other arm. We're sitting down on the couch. We're watching a documentary about all things Mount St. Helens. And I'm like, listen, kids, useless information will be so helpful to you. (laughs) Like, I love documentaries. I, I just, I enjoy them. I geek out on them. And one of my favorite documentaries is a documentary called The Barkley Marathons. And it documents the story of what is largely considered to be the hardest and most bizarre race in the entire world. It's the hardest race because it is a 100-mile race that goes through the mountains of Middle Tennessee, and participants have 60 hours to complete this 100-mile race. And in the 25 years that it has been in existence, only 15 people have ever finished it. It's hard. It is hard. Now, it's bizarre because of the pageantry that, that surrounds it. Uh, to, to register for this race, you must write an essay as to why you should be allowed to run the Barkley Marathon. And then you have to include in cash the $1.60 registration fee. 
Now, if you're accepted into the race, you get a letter of condolence from the race's organizer, Lazarus Lake. And here's a picture of Lazarus here, so you can kind of get a feel for what this race is all about. That's the guy right there. He's writing you a handwritten letter. I am so sorry to inform you that you have been accepted to run in the Barkley Marathons. <laughs> okay, then upon that letter of condolence, you also receive what the additional registration items that you need to bring. So one of those things is when you show up on race day, you need to bring a license plate from your city or state or province or country of origin because people drive or come from all over the world to participate in this race. And then Lazarus decides whatever personal item that he just so happens to need at that time, that's going to be your additional registration fee. So it might be socks, it might be shirts, it might be a sweatshirt, it might be a jacket, but you show up on race day with a license plate and whatever Lazarus needs, like, you know, a pair of socks. On race day, the race begins any time between noon and midnight. So it's like psychological torture. It's like, all right, go back to your campsites. Anytime in the next 12 hours, you're going to be called to the starting line. They're called to the starting line when Lazarus blows a conch shell. <laughs> Alerts all, all the runners. And the race is started not by a pistol, but it started when he lights a cigarette. So he lights a cigarette, and they're off and rolling. And like I said... 100 miles in 60 hours through the mountains of Middle Tennessee. Only 15 people have ever finished it. It is an incredible test of endurance. The idea of endurance is that you would be able to maintain a constant state despite hardship or fatigue or difficulty. And here's what we know and what the Barkley Marathon shows us and what we just intrinsically know to be true is that human endurance has a limit, doesn't it? We have a limit to what we can endure physically. We have a limit to what we can endure mentally and relationally and emotionally. We have limits. We are limited creatures. But what we learn from Scripture is that Jesus is not confined to those same limits. And because of that, he can give us freely enduring love, love that, is in, that endures forever. He's known as our everlasting father because his love has no end. He loves us without limitation. I love how Charles Spurgeon put it. He said this, there is no unfathering Christ and there is no unchilding us. His love is everlasting. Look at what Romans 8, 35 says, and then we're going to skip down to verses 38 and 39. It says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Before we continue reading, think about that statement just for a moment. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Isn't that beautiful? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword or COVID-19? It's in my Bible. I don't know about yours. It's in mine. Verse 38, it says, I am convinced. I'm convinced. There's no changing my mind that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons nor the present or the future nor any powers, height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Man, that's some good Bible, isn't it? What could separate us from the love of God? Personally, what really encourages me as I read that passage is that it reminds me that if, if his love endures, then our future is secure. If his love endures, our future is secure. Man, if there's anything that this last year has taught us is that life can really throw a nasty curveball. 
That thing drops out of the strike zone like no one's business. Right? Life can, life can get turned upside down so quickly that we can't even process it. You know, we've learned this, this year that, that health is fickle, that wealth is fickle, that our emotions are fickle, that our plans are fickle. And when we're faced with the reality of our own fragility, man, it can really make us uneasy in the present and unsure of the future, can it? But the Bible says that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In the midst of ever-changing circumstances, we fix our eyes on the one who is never changing. We're reminded that Jesus said that he will never leave us or forsake us. We're reminded that his love endures. He is our everlasting Father. He's not our temporary. He's our everlasting Father. And if his love endures, then our future is secure. I love what Romans 8.31 says, that if God is for us, who could ever be against us? Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 says that Jesus will be known to you and I as everlasting Father. What that means is that Jesus has redefined what love is. And that love, according to Jesus, is unconditional, it's sacrificial, and it endures forever. And because the love of Jesus is unconditional, we have something to anchor our identity into. And because the love of Jesus is is sacrificial, we never have to question our value again. And because the love of Jesus endures, our future is secure. You know, I was thinking this morning, I was reading through my notes and drinking a cup of coffee on the couch before I came up to the church today. And I was just pondering this time and, and praying about this time specifically. And the thought really crossed my mind is, you know, where the rubber really hits the road for us is the step after we really believe and receive in the love that we just described. Because here's here's what Jesus said in John chapter 13. He says, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Whoa. And then he said this. He said, the world will know you are my disciples by the way you love one another. So I wonder what the implications are of that in our family. I wonder what the implications are of that as we relate to those who we may disagree with. I wonder how we relate to that, to, how we use that to relate to those who we work with or go to school with. I wonder what the implications are of us truly taking that to heart to say, Jesus, I know that you have loved me unconditionally, sacrificially, and in a way that endures forever. So now I want to be an accurate reflection of that to those around me. I wonder what the implication of that is. So consider this the start of a broader conversation that I hope takes place in your homes throughout the rest of this week, in your cars, your living rooms, at your dinner table, as an individual reflecting on these things. What does it mean to love others the way that Jesus has loved us? As a married couple, how does this, what are the, what are the, how does this impact every area of our life. As a family unit, how does the love of Jesus impact how we tangibly treat those around us? I pray that as we consider these things, the Lord would lead us and guide us and give us the strength that we need to to act on what he stirs up in our heart. I think the other action step that needs to just be made 
available and that I would, man, I would miss the mark by a mile if I shared this message about the love of Jesus and did not provide the opportunity for individuals to respond to that in a life-changing way. And maybe you're here today in person, maybe you're tuning in online, and you've heard this message about just how much Jesus loves you. And he doesn't just say it, he's proven it with his actions. He's laid down his life. He's taken ownership of your sin. He's made a way for you to be free and forgiven. And I don't need to, I don't need to dress it up, put a bow on top of it. The Holy Spirit's already working in your heart. And you just know that it's time for you to take that step. If that's you, whether you're in person or online, that's a decision you can make between you and God where you just say, I can't do this life on my own. I recognize that I fall short, that I am a sinner in need of a savior. Jesus, would you come into my life? Forgive me of my sins. I wanna live for you. And if today you just feel like that's your, that's your decision, we would love to hear about it for a couple reasons. Number one, that is the best decision you will ever make in your life, period. And secondly, we want to help just kind of guide and steer you in the right direction in your faith. We have this wonderful thing here at, at Lake City called Rooted. It's like a, it's like a, the theology 101 foundations of faith opportunity and that would be a great spot for you to get plugged in so if you're here and you want to make that decision or you're online you can go to the hub if you're here you can fill out a next steps card if you're here if you're online get at us in the chat there we'll follow up with you that's the best decision you can make truly let's pray Jesus thank you so much that you love us thank you that your love is unconditional that it's sacrificial that it's enduring thank you that our identity and our value and our future can rest in your love Lord would you give us the faith that we need to really believe in and receive the love that you so freely give and would you give us the strength to be an accurate reflection of that love in practical and tangible ways as we walk through the rest of this week? Lord, I thank you for those who have made the decision to cross the line of faith today. Thank you that the old is gone, the new has come. Thank you that their sins are forgiven, that they are free. And Lord, help us all to be people of love this week. We love you, Lord. We thank you. We pray all these things in your precious and holy name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Well, thank you so much for being here today. Don't forget, Christmas Eve online. Be sure to tune in. Next Sunday is also online, home for the holidays, so enjoy that. And next time we gather in this place, 2020 will be in the rearview mirror, and we're in 2021, baby. Hey, have a great rest of your week. You stand to your feet. You're officially dismissed. Have a great one, everyone. Merry Christmas.